Okay, is there any discussion? I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Okay, we, uh, number 10 was suggested to be on the consent agenda, but I, I think it was pulled uh, for, I think it was, I'm not sure if Councillor Young that pulled it, uh, but perhaps if we want, if, I, if we want uh, the movers and seconder to uh, discuss it and motivate first. I'll, I'll move the motion and, uh, okay, and just to very briefly, um, I'll speak for myself on this. One of the issues for me that uh, continually uh, created concern as we moved through the complexity of trying to create local regulations for uh, cannabis uh, management uh, from a business perspective in the city was the, the clause that specifically excluded the ability of there to be any on-site use. And it's, it's not that I'm particularly arguing for on-site use for everyone, but there are a couple of um, not-for-profit clubs, often referred to as compassion clubs in the city, uh, that I think uh, have provided a very valuable service for many, many decades uh, without any type of uh, concern being raised by the public uh, in a very modest and very thoughtful way. And I was trying to sort of think about uh, what, what, if any, possibility there was to provide for those, just those particular uh, organizations uh, an exemption for this particular clause. And so this is put forward uh, and with the assumption that the goal is clear, but very clearly I, I also, want to, also want to remind us that what will happen if we choose to approve this today is that staff will then consider uh, the motion and come back to Council uh, with some recommended wording uh, in order to uh, make it meet the tests uh, that we have around bylaw language, etc. So the goal here is to provide staff with um, the facility and direction to actually go and do that. So it is, this is nothing that's going to be automatic. We will see it again. Uh, but I wanted to make sure uh, with my colleagues, um, Councillor thornton Joe and Councillor Loveday, that uh, at least we were having this conversation in a proactive way because I think that there is a, a case to be made for these two particular organizations. And just briefly, the reference to the date there uh, is specific to confine the consideration of this exemption to those two organizations. Uh, to my knowledge, and I have uh, consulted with um, both the industry and a variety of folks who have long history in this city around this issue, that um, with that date included uh, that there would only be the two that we often refer to, uh, and so that's why that's there in particular. Uh, so this isn't, this isn't the last. We'll see if this, I think this is an ongoing issue. But if we choose to support this today, then staff will then have the direction to go off and, and create the appropriate language and bring that back to us. Okay. Councillor Loveday is the seconder. Pass for now, um, and perhaps I'll speak as even uh, since I my name is listed as a, as a, I guess a third or uh, <laughs> joined in the motion. Um, I did have concerns as, as well, but I, I do have concerns about opening up um, consumption services for cannabis at at this time. Um, but recognizing that there have been two long-standing uh, nonprofits who have served the. Uh, those who use cannabis for medicinal purposes for many, many years, and to actually, instead of opening up what they've always desired to open up, that we actually go back and close uh, some of the uh, uses that they have used uh, and they have fought for for, for many years. And I, I think one thing I've learned about um, uh, cannabis regulation is, is the, the depth and the breadth of individuals that use cannabis uh, for medicinal purposes and want to be able to use it legally, um, and, and uh, not be stigmatized and not get into trouble because of they can't uh, use in their their home uh, or for fear of eviction. Um, don't want to be on the sidewalk using because uh, of the, the stigma of it, uh, but need it for medicinal purposes. So, so you know, I, I think there are some businesses or other new uh, dispensaries that want this open to all of them. and. Perhaps in the future that, that um, you know that may come that I don't know, but for now I see that the two that have been existing for many years, um, as as, as Councillor Alta said, uh, since 2009, with relatively uh, few um, concerns from the public and and. Uh, uh, the police department uh, that we uh, we allow that, and I think we heard many speakers come and express their concerns that uh, if there were no place to to uh, consume their their medicine, um, so that's some, uh, my reason for supporting this motion. And uh, I'm going to now go to Councillor Isaac, who also had his hand up. Yeah, I support the motion. Um, a question to staff: um, We had a lot of debate earlier this year around quotas relating to pedicabs, and would one way 
of accomplishing this to be creating essentially um, two licenses for compassion clubs, um, having selection criteria that um, could put weight on uh, track record and uh, demonstrated uh, operations and mitigation of impacts, um, and then evaluate any applications received which would likely result in a strong likelihood that uh, the two applications or the two operations that the movers are trying to uh, catch could receive those licenses. Because I think is the issue that we want to grandfather two existing nonprofits, or is it that we think that the public, particularly people with medical ailments, should have access uh, to this service, not only to the, the product, the substance, but also to uh, a social environment where they can consume the substance. And if that's the case, then the, the, the problem with the grandfathering provision is that if either operation goes belly up, access to that service declines. And if both of them go belly up, then that service is gone. Whereas if the, from a higher level policy standpoint, if we think that people who are sick um, and consume marijuana for relief from pain uh, have grown accustomed to consuming it in a social environment at these clubs, and we think it's uh, reasonable for them to continue doing that, then I think maybe that kind of a compassion club license or subcategory of the license would be the way to go. So just some thinking. We'd obviously leave it with our staff to come back. But I think, I think my preference would be to see it more approached along those lines rather than a grandfathering because for that reason I reference that if we think this service should be provided in the long run, then some uh, mechanism for who gets recognized and how and how would a new entity be recognized if an existing operation ceased to exist. Um, I think we obviously don't want to open the floodgates. I think um, corporate lawyers and others can be very creative in defining uh, business operations as nonprofits to circumvent uh, regulations or for other purposes. And so uh, I think, and if we did open up a crack, I think we could see a lot of the existing commercial dispensaries try to slide into that exemption, maybe having an auxiliary operation that's a nonprofit where their customers could consume the substance. But, and I don't think that's the intent of the motion, and I wouldn't support us uh, opening up exemptions that way. Um, so, but I do support a reasonable accommodation uh, for approximately two um, compassion clubs in the city. Yeah, I have found um, speakers list, uh, Councillor Young, Lucas, and then back to all two. Councillor Young? Uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not able to support this. Actually, for some of the reasons that um, Councillor Isaac uh, uh, mentioned as reservations. Um, uh, my memory of this is vague, but I recall we've, we've had a representative from a compassion club who has made a number of um, addresses to council in the past, and uh, I, somebody may be able to refresh my memory, but there was some kind of newspaper story with regard to income taxes, and um, my conclusion from the uh, the various discussions that took place were that far from being a non-profit venture, this was indeed a very high-profit venture. Um, as Councillor Isaac pointed out, um, a non-profit uh, can still, uh, is a pretty wide um, net, uh, and it can still um, pay very high um, remuneration to various officers of the of the organization. Um, now, if it were a charitable organization, then Revenue Canada puts much stricter constraints on it. Um, but even but with nonprofits, um, uh, I, I don't know. I assume nonprofits have to have a board. I don't know if we've if we have constraints on the appointment of the board, I don't know how, um, what constraints there are on the governance of the organizations. Um, but I would like to have those spelled out. Uh, partly, as Councillor Isaac suggests, um, so that new organizations coming in could meet the requirements. Well, the gist of this motion is we don't want to bother 
laying down a set of requirements that everyone would have to meet. We just want the people we know to be able to continue to operate. That is exactly the kind of thing that the Municipal Act doesn't really like us doing, making special rules for our friends or the people we know so that they can operate and other people can't. Um, I think that probably there will be a provision for this. Um, at some point, the medical health officer is going to bring in regulations uh, dealing with indoor cannabis smoking. I assume they're going to follow somewhat along the regulations of the tobacco smoking regulations. They'll be designed to uh, protect, for example, employees of the nonprofit from being overly exposed to smoke to the detriment of their health. Uh, they will protect uh, nearby residents um, and, and so forth. Um, I think if we, and I, I think as I suspect, we will go down this line at some point, uh, but uh, this, this idea that we can shortcut it cut the process, uh, designate some people that we know and say there it's okay for them to operate, but nobody else. Um, no, it's not an approach that I can support. Thank you, Councillor Young. Uh, we, next I have Councillor Lucas. Oh, so um, you've had your question addressed, uh, Councillor Alto? Um, yeah, I, I completely understand the, the uh, comments that have been made, and, and um, <laughs> you know, originally, I, I, I think some long time ago, I, I was very reluctant, uh, along with Councillor Young, to even go down this path as far as regulatory uh, regulations of the service. But uh, you know, given where we are and, and the circumstances that we find ourselves in, and what we're looking at, I think that there is an argument to be made to, in fact, isolate out these two particular organizations based upon their history and their. Um, I guess proven track record is the phrase that I heard. And I'm, I'm not particularly interested um, in trying to create a, uh, an opportunity for there to be an expansion of service of on-site use. And partially that's because I think we've already spent enough time on this particular file. Uh, we will eventually uh, be looking at this in the context of uh, federal regulation and I suspect that that will indeed consider the issue of on-site use and you know whether we uh, whether we're being impatient with the, the speed at which this is being undertaken federally, it is coming. And so I think that that is the context in which uh, uh, certainly I'm thinking about dealing with just these two particular organizations without trying to open that door further. Uh, I think it's important to remember that what we're asking here is for our staff to go away and come back to us with the appropriate language. So, you know, they've heard our conversations and I'm sure we'll, you know, try and incorporate as much as is reasonable. The thing that I didn't say at the beginning was um, the experience in Vancouver recently in trying to deal with exactly this issue is what pointed uh, certainly me in this direction, and that is, uh, you know, Vancouver did try and do the route of describing nonprofits and describing particular organ uh, particular types of organizations and services and whatnot, and did find almost immediately that it was very easy to get around, <laughs> and so. You know, the specifics in this particular one didn't go down that direction because I think it just creates sort of a puzzle for folks to try and solve. And the reference to uh, the 2009, again, is specific to isolate out the two existing uh, clubs uh, that are here in Victoria. So uh, I, I'm comfortable leaving this now in the hands of staff, uh, trusting that they'll be able to come up with some language that fits the bylaw but also accomplishes this particular goal. And I'm also comfortable in acknowledging that this is intended to facilitate the ongoing operations of two particular organizations who have proven to be uh, good uh, corporate and community, non-for-profit citizens uh, here in the city providing what I think is a very valuable service uh, without any particular concerns over their decades of service. So I'm hoping that Council will see a fit to support this today and enable our staff to go off and, and take the next steps. Mr. Coates. Thank you, Acting Mayor Thornton, Joe, and members of Council. So there's a number of complexities involved with uh, the consideration around the motion that Council's uh, got on the, on the floor at the moment. Um, so to this point, staff have only done a very sort of basic analysis about what 
what some of the options to uh, to consider how to implement this direction might look like. Uh, if council chooses to pass the motion, that would uh, establish the situation. Uh, and, and this proposed motion is broad enough to encourage a sort of full spectrum analysis about what what those regulatory um, options would look like. Excuse me, one of the things I, I just would think it would be uh, worthy to comment on at this point is, um, so this sort of regime is, is certainly distinct from um, petty cabs and other sort of scenarios where council has been involved with uh, licenses that are capped. And, and the one thing that uh, runs true through all of these processes is there is no process to uh, vet a business license in a discretionary manner. So um, for example, I think one of the comments was could there be applications made from a number of businesses and, 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 and have that sort of drill down to a, a defined number to be awarded? The short answer to that is no, that process can't occur with any business license situation. But there are a number of other options uh, that, again, at council's discretion, if, if um, there's an interest to have staff pursue what those options look like. We can do that, bring that back in a report that talks about the options and, and what the implications of those options would be. Okay, thank you, Mr. Goetz. Uh, Councillor Madoff. Thank you. I'm very supportive of the motion and very supportive of the opportunity for staff to look to see what options uh, might be available. As I recall, many, many, many months ago when we first began to discuss the issue of cannabis regulation, uh, I remember one issue that was uh, top of mind for me, but I think for some of my colleagues as well, was the impact on the existing compassion clubs when we looked at cost of business licenses and that sort of thing. And at the time, I had a sense that there was going to be a way that we could deal with that. That seemed to have fallen away during that longer consultation process, but to me it's really important to come back to that issue and see what regulations we might be able to consider. So I'm very appreciative of the motion being brought forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Coleman. Thank you. Um, Councillor Alto's second motivation uh, was more compelling than the first, I think, um, because it recognizes the history that got us to this point. The reality is we're still sitting in that gray zone before we know exactly what federal regulation legislation will say. Um, and a number of jurisdictions have tried to deal with this issue. In Vancouver, we saw differential fees for compassion clubs versus medical marijuana dispensaries or cannabis dispensaries more broadly. Um, I, I think that this actually is supportable because it puts a cap on the number of compassion clubs, um, that, that slightly different zone than we had in, in the past, um, that was problematic to us before. The reality is this is a short-term uh, regulation that may carry on in the future or may not, depending on federal authorities. What we're trying to do is make sure that you don't end up with the battlegrounds that we saw previous to 2009. And there were some. Um, there was, there was uh, police interaction that the police felt badly about, that they were enforcing a law that they weren't sure about. Um, we found a middle ground that could work with unease on everybody's part. And I think that, that what this is trying to do is say, okay, we've got to get back to that point um, and you don't want to see an expansion of the number of people who want to play a compassion club opportunity as an area to grow when really they're more commercial enterprises. Is it perfect? Nope. <laughs> That's fine. But this does recognize the hist part of the history that got us here and the fact that we're waiting for guidance from federal le legislation and regulation that will tell us how we proceed in the future. So this is very much... Short term, I hope short term means we get to deal with it by the end of 2017. I'm not entirely convinced, um, but I think that this is supportable as a pro tem. Okay, any other discussion? Councillor Isaac? Yeah, the discussion around the federal uh, regulations, I've tr been trying to figure out why it doesn't sit particularly well with me, and I think it's that I don't think one size fits all is going to um, work for the very diverse um, cultures and attitudes in Canada. I think in our, uh, in our community and 
presumably in Vancouver, the city of Vancouver as well, public opinion supports this more distributed model where essentially I think public opinion supports the legalization of medicinal and recreational marijuana and the public wants bylaws in place to ensure uh, that activity uh, happens responsibly and reduces impacts on others and that there's a reasonable rate of taxation and that there's no access to minors. Um, and, uh, and a part of that is that people who are sick can access the substance and also consume it uh, in a reasonable way. Um, there may be other parts of Canada where that's not acceptable and they may go for more of a big brother, heavy handed, uh, top down approach, uh, handing it to an oligopoly or a monopoly. For example, how, um, uh, what Ontario has done with beer distribution, giving the major brewers uh, a monopoly uh, over the sale of beer in that province. And there's certainly a very strong lobby from uh, various actors to try to restrict the distribution of cannabis to either liquor stores, uh, both public and private, or now we see uh, Shoppers Drug Mart and maybe other major pharmaceutical interests trying to um, corner that part of the market. My personal view is that in Victoria, and probably in Vancouver as well, the, uh, uh, the horse has left the barn, or I don't know, the train has left the station, and I would hope that whatever federal, whatever rules the federal government decides upon, it will allow some autonomy to communities uh, to shape what distribution looks like. And there's nothing in Canada's constitution that says it's a federal responsibility to regulate the distribution of marijuana. That's a product of the war on drugs, um, the American sort of uh, practice from the 1920s, where we decided that this substance needed to be subject to rigorous federal criminal control. But the same way alcohol is a distribution is a responsibility of the province, and the provinces have chosen to um, delegate some of that, or at least some uh, consultation to local government, based on the hearing we just did this morning. Um, I think that that model, there's no reason that same model of the federal government allowing the province to be the constitutional body and having the province delegate some responsibility to local government there's no reason that can't work for cannabis as well. So that's a roundabout way of saying that we may want to consider and ask to the feds uh, that their, their model uh, potentially uh, reflects uh, local government interests and allows for communities to have a role in deciding uh, uh, what kind of cannabis distribution and usage is appropriate. Okay, thank you, Councillor Isaac. Uh, any last comments before I call the question? Councillor Loveday. Yeah, just uh, <clears throat> in response to Councillor Isaac's last, question, uh, last comments, we actually have communicated that to the federal government, I think twice now, and uh, still haven't received any response, unfortunately. Um, looking at a question to Mr. Coates, um, if this is approved, what would you see as next steps? Through the acting mayor, so uh, staff would go away and, and come back to council with a report on uh, how to implement the spirit of, of the motion uh, that you're considering. And so, as I noted earlier, there's a number of complexities involved with this. It's not really clear at this point exactly how this would be implemented. I think it's generally understood that um, as specific as, as the direction is suggested here that um, that two businesses in particular, by virtue of the, the length of time they've been in operation, that's really not going to uh, likely um, come forward as, as solid criteria in a bylaw regulation. But um, our work, uh, if this is passed, would involve how best council could um, get as close to that as possible, for lack of a better way to describe it. Okay, that being said, I'm gonna call the question. Uh, all those in favor? Oppose, uh, one oppose, Councillor Young. Okay, thank you, Council. Uh, so the last.